Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 181, where we interview Julie Kent, a software engineer from Nashville, and talk about keeping up with the Joneses and purchasing on your timeline from a position of financial strength. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen, and with me as always is my, I've recently discovered scotch, but I only like the gross peaty scotches that taste like I'm drinking dirt, co-host Scott Trench. Your intros are just always on the rocks, Mindy. Let's keep moving. (laughs) Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, to introduce you to every money story because we truly believe financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, or just slowly buy a handful of rental properties over the course of a decade, we'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so you can launch yourself towards those dreams. Scott, I am so excited to talk to Julie today. She is a former Bigger Pockets employee, so it's always nice to catch up with them. And she has a really great story about investing in real estate, as you alluded to, by buying a handful of properties over the course of a decade. And I like her story because she focuses on buying when she's comfortable, not because somebody else thinks that she should or because she thinks she should because somebody else just bought. And I think that's a point that gets a little bit lost sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, uh, Mindy and I are, are friends with Julie. She, she used to work at Bigger Pockets. Um, and she's got a, a great story that I think is really what the story of real estate investing in America is for most people. We always hear about these folks who are buying a million properties at once and doing a bunch of burrs or whatever. But most rental properties are owned by people like Julie, not by people that are doing dozens or hundreds of deals and own a ton of properties. Most properties are owned by, I would call, small millionaires, you know, that 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 one one to two to three million dollar net worth range accumulated over a, a long a period of time. I don't know. We don't we don't actually get to know Julie's specific net worth at this moment in time, but if she's not there yet, she'll be there soon. Um, and she's doing really well and it's fantastic. And this is a perfectly appropriate, wonderful way to invest in real estate and build wealth over time. It's exactly what I've been doing and what I intend to do with my portfolio over time. So really refreshing. Um, obviously really supportive. I think it's a great idea because I'm doing it. Um, and <laughs> and, uh, and learned a lot from Julie. Julie Kent, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. It's so good to see you. So good to see you too. It's been a while. It has been a while. Julie Kent is a former developer for Bigger Pockets, and she now lives in Nashville, or just outside of Nashville, where she is amassing a real estate empire, courtesy of all the information she learned during her time at Bigger Pockets. So, Julie, let's get started on your money story. Where does your journey with money begin? Yeah, so I grew up with uh, with a with a family structure that definitely instilled um, frugality and saving and, and not spending more than you make, which uh, I feel very lucky to have had um, good role models in my life. And that kind of helped put me in a good position for when I did want to start getting into real estate, I had some capital available to do that. So um, yeah, I bought my first property in 2010, um, graduated college and the government was offering the um, first time home buyers tax credit. And so I got a job out of college, had some money lying around and decided to take advantage of that. And that's kind of where it's, where at least my real estate journey started. Can you walk us through the house and how that contributed to your wealth story? Yeah. So um, I had never, I I seem to get myself in situations a lot where I'm moving to places that I've never been before and like buying properties where I've never lived before. So yeah, I just kind of like found a house that looked reasonable that was in budget and um, just, just did it. And um, it was, I don't know, kind of scary, but where was it located? It was located in um, Windsor Heights, Iowa, which is like kind of a suburb of Des Moines. And did you okay. have a job there? Yeah, I had accept- I had accepted a job um, and had thought about renting, but just decided with that um, tax credit that I should buy a house. 
And did you do any like running of the numbers or did you just decide, hey, I can afford this much house. So that's how much for house I'm going to buy. Yeah, I, um, you know, kind of thought about uh, what the monthly payment would be and how much I, you know, felt like I could afford comfortably. I definitely wasn't looking to um, purchase anything extravagant, just being one person. I knew I didn't need a huge house. Um, and at that time, I mean, real estate in, in Des Moines is still fairly affordable. So it wasn't super difficult at that time, especially given, given economic conditions to find something that, you know, wasn't too expensive. I think I paid 100 and, 120, $129,000 for that first house. Okay. And, and how much, how much was that, um, relative, what were you, what could you have bought if you had qualified or maxed out to your, your, your debt to income? That's a good question. Um, I don't remember for that house. Um, but I do remember when I went to buy my second house, I was, uh, dating someone at the time and we got pre-approved for like $575,000. And I was just like, this is, this is insane. Um, I, yeah, I, it was crazy. I, I imagine that when you started out your career, it, it was in software development. Is that right? Uh, no, my first job out of college was more in kind of like business finance work. Okay. Well, can you give us a, a ballpark of the income in that first job? Uh, my starting salary was 50,000 bucks. Okay. So, so for context, when I, when I bought my first property in 2014, I was making a little under 50,000 bucks a year and I qualified for like $250,000. And so the point I'm trying to make is that, Hey, yeah, maybe this wasn't like a super intentional or, you know, uh, thing with your first purchase. But the what, one thing you did really well is you bought probably at less than 50% of your purchasing power uh, on this property. So it wasn't r really a big gamble in a, in, a, in a sense compared to what a lot of people do when they buy at the top of their purchasing price range. Yeah, I kind of compared what I would have wanted to spend on rent and then was pleasantly surprised that I could buy a house and my mortgage payment would be less than what I would have paid on rent. And so that to me was a win and I didn't want to go over that. That's how I did it with my first one too. It was, it was rent was, this was a hundred years ago, rent was $410 and my mortgage payment with the $200 a month HOA was $417. So I was like, oh, this is a win. And I, the HOA was ridiculous and I should have run the numbers and all of that, but it was really nice to, um, to be able to go right next to each other and compare it like that. Um, mm -hmm. so what was your mortgage payment on that property? Uh, I believe it was around 800, 700, 800 bucks. So what, hap what happens next? So you graduate college, you've got a good, uh, it sounds like good credit. You've got some savings. You've got now this house, you've got a $50,000 a year job. How, how do things progress from there and, and your journey continue? Yeah. So yeah, uh, I lived in that house for, I think about two years. Um, and then I was dating someone and we decided that we wanted to have a, a bigger space. Um, and so I tried to sell that property and it just sat on the market and would not sell. And I was having lunch with a coworker um, one day and kind of complaining about that. And he just said, that would be the perfect rental property. You should rent that out. And me being like early twenties, I was like, oh, you're crazy. Like, I can't, I can't do that. So I let it sit on the market for another couple of months. And my boyfriend and I at the time were just getting, you know, frustrated. And so I finally uh, emailed that guy again and was like, hey, talk to me more about this. And he was super helpful. He provided me like sample leases, sample application, kind of walked me through the whole process. And so I put that house up for rent and then um, we bought the bigger house that we naively thought was going to make our relationship so much better. We moved into that house <laughs> and then about like, about like three Two months bathrooms. later, 
<laughs> oh, yes, there's more than one bathroom. Um, yeah, we, we moved into that house and then like three months later, we, we promptly broke up. And so um, I, I stayed living in that house for a while. I got a roommate. Um, did you but it buy was that just, property together or is that an, is it in your name or how, how did that work? We unfortunately bought that together. Um, also, not the smartest thing to do. Um, okay, so let, let, let's we're gonna we're gonna have to spend some time here. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, so so with the first property, before we get to that, how much were you able to rent it for, and what was the mortgage? So I rented it for twelve hundred dollars, and yeah, the mortgage was like seven hundred, eight hundred bucks. Great. And so you are probably a little cash flow positive, maybe break even after all the expenses and that kind of stuff, but solid little rental property on the first, first purchase. Yep. A great option yeah. because you bought below your means on the first, on the first one. Yep. Let's talk about what's the second property like and how did you jointly purchase the property? How, how did you mechanically jointly purchase the property together? And then what was the outcome? Yeah. So we, we applied to be on the, the mortgage together. Um, the house, I believe we purchased for $292,000. It was like a, it's like a five bedroom, four bath house in an, another suburb of Des Moines. Um, and I ended up putting definitely more down for the down payment than he did. But I think, I don't know, maybe he contributed like 10 or 15,000 bucks or something like that. Um, so yeah, we are both on the mortgage. And so then when we broke up, um, he stayed on the mortgage for quite some time, but then eventually he wanted off the mortgage because him and his new girlfriend wanted to buy a house. <laughs> and so then it sucked because I had to like refinance the whole thing. Um, pay, I, I actually refinanced to a higher interest rate, which really sucked. And yeah, I, I won't, I won't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I just want to know, like mechanically, because this is this is something that a lot of people do, right? You're not alone in, in in making this this decision to do this, and I would love to spend just a moment more here, understanding, like, okay, so you're both on the deed, you both own the property jointly, yep. and you're both on the mortgage. He wants off the mortgage, and so how does that work? To see, is he out of the property now? Does he continue to own any? equitable interest in the property following your refinance or how, what, what happens there? I, so when we broke up, I immediately like bought him out of what he had put down. So I was like, here's your 10 or $15,000 back. Um, I like the, that. I like that. Cause yeah. it's, it's only been three months way back in what was this? 2010, 2012. This would have been, yeah. 2012. About. Yeah. So back then houses weren't appreciating like right now, your house is worth more tomorrow than when you bought it today. It's ridiculous. But so it hasn't really appreciated that much. Here's all the money. Now you're square yep. and now you own the house, but he's still on the mortgage. So is there no way to just extricate him from the mortgage without a refi? Why would the lender do that? I guess, right? Well, I exactly. Although Julie is a well-qualified applicant because she was. Well, let let's check that actually. So. <laughs> Prior to buying this, you were you were you bought a house for 130, which is well within your means. You're already yeah. on that mortgage, and now you're buying a property for 292,000. Is that what we we said? Yep. And mm -hmm. that might be right at the bubble, or even slightly beyond your means at that point. For all we know, what, how would you how would you say you're into you as an individual were qualified to buy that property? Yeah. So yeah, the fact that with both of our incomes, I think it was fine, but. Um, yeah, the mortgage on that property was it, well. It's sixteen hundred dollars a month. So yeah, that's you know that that's a pretty good size mortgage payment. So when we broke up and he moved out, I did find a roommate to um, pay me a little bit of rent, um, and okay. because I just didn't need that big a yeah, I just and I didn't need that big of a space. So that definitely helped. But, but yeah, I don't think there's a way to get someone off a mortgage without refinancing and then doing like the quit claim deed or what, whatever it is. Okay. I think that's important to note because uh, like Scott said, I see a lot of people asking, Oh, I want to buy a house with my, with my significant other that I am not married to. Well, okay. Then you need to really consider all of the things and you should be able to qualify for that mortgage by yourself 
should you break up? And it's unfortunate that you break up, but when you're going to buy the house, you're not thinking, ooh, I wonder what's going to happen to break up if we break up. And you should be thinking that. For yeah, sure. It, and I want to point out that this is this is a best case scenario for an exit for one of these situations. If there's any hostility in the, it doesn't sound like there was, or it sounds like you guys are at least able to communicate rationally and, and, and manage the situation. But if there's hostility, how much more difficult does that become? And you're forced to sell that property to get to, to, to clean things up and, and take a big loss, most, most likely in that situation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. If I, I think I was lucky enough to have enough cash to buy him out. Um, if I hadn't have been able to do that, then we probably would have had to sell the house and, you know, lose a bunch of money. Right. Even if you, that's even if you can sell the house. Right. Yeah. Well, let's walk through that cash situation. So it sounds like you graduated from college in a relatively debt-free situation with a significant, with a reasonable amount of cash. Is that just from having saved up during childhood and, and working during college? I don't know. How did, how did you accumulate that cash to get started? And then how did that expand over the time period we just discussed? Yeah. So I think when I went to college, I opened up a bank account when I got to college and I think I had like 4,000 bucks. Um, and then, yeah, I worked throughout college full time and just saved a lot of that money. I was lucky enough that um, I didn't end up having to take out any student debt, so I didn't have that to worry about. Um, so yeah, I had I had a reasonable amount of money when I graduated college. And then, yeah, once I started working, um, I have just, yeah, I've always just grown up like very frugal. And so... I just saved a lot. I saved just a lot of money. I did not, um, did not spend a lot. How, how, like, are we talking to like 20,000 in savings per year kind of deal? Um, more or less what, what's kind of like a ballpark. Yeah. So when I, when I graduate, I've never been really like a budgeter. Um, I've kind of just always had some like basic kind of mantras and themes. And then that just kind of allows me to save a reasonable amount of money. I, I just, I don't really keep track of it though. Um, but even, I think pretty much my entire life, I've always worked like more than one job as well. So um, when I, when I got that $50,000 a year job, like I was doing other, other work as well and just pocketing that money too. Okay, so but what I want to point out is that another advantage or another thing that bailed you out of the situation was the fact that you did this and you were strongly capitalized because you have this cash likely due to just how you conduct your, your life and and how you preserve your income, those types of things. And again, how much more difficult does the situation get if you don't have the option to throw down cash um, and understand the basic economics of the situation? So if you're going to. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. First, I think the first lesson is don't buy a house with a significant <laughs> other that is not part of a very long-term relationship. You know, marry some get into this whole thing about married or not and that kind of thing. But you know, it sounds like that was too short of a relationship to be buying a house. But from there, all of these other problems are made that much easier if you have cash with which to deploy to throw against them, because now you have op an option besides selling the property in a rush, in a, in a hurry, uh, with a, a, you know, a, a former ex. So maybe we need a new term, Scott. We keep talking about financial independence and people equate that with, then I can quit my job, but we need to be like financially, uh, financial options. Like Julie mm -hmm. has so many options. She can choose this or this or this or this or this because she doesn't spend every dollar that comes in because she has other streams of income. So even if she lost her job tomorrow, she would still be able to pay the rent, pay the mortgage, pay, you know, all the bills. And, and she has this giant fund. If all of her strengths of streams of income dried up. I, I know folks make that, that who in, at, at this point in life were making the same amount of money as Julie and they, they, one of the roommates isn't paying the rent on like a $2,000 rent or something like that. And so they just all decide not to pay the rent and get evicted and have an eviction on their, their record and oh, like all, jointly and severally all the money. It's like, come on, if you're like Julie, you just like, okay, these, 
guys, you know, I was thinking of a polite adjective. Um, these guys can go and, and, and do whatever, and I'm just going to pay it and move on with my life and those kinds of things. And that's, that's the option that good financial habits give you rather than, Oh, I'm going to just like allow myself to now get evicted because I'm too spiteful or don't have enough cash to just get myself out of this situation. Anyways, I'm very, I'm impressed. <laughs> Julie has a great story. I want to go back to your, um, the applic in the application to be on the show, you said that you've always been frugal and a saver. And then you said, my dad taught me a lot in that regard. And you said, I worked full time throughout college and ended up graduating in three years so I could save a year of tuition. F working full time and taking a, what, time and a quarter load so you can get done quicker? More than mm -hmm. time and a quarter, time and a third load. That's huge. How did your dad teach you about saving? And what made you think that you should graduate in three years? So, oh gosh, I mean... Growing up, my dad never, ne my dad still to this day has never bought a new car. It's always, you know, the five-year-old Honda Civic. Um, my parents still live in the same house that they li lived in for 30, 30 40 years. Um, we did not take extravagant vacations. We stayed at Super 8 and Motel 6. Um, but we still took tons of vacations. I mean, we just, but we drove, we did not fly very often. We would drive and just kind of do these road trips and stay at cheap hotels. And um, even Christmases, I remember it, it used to bother me. Like I always felt like my friends were getting more Christmas gifts than I was getting. And for the longest time, probably until I was like 13 or 14 and had a better understanding of what my dad did for work. Like I thought we were broke. Like, I thought we just didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> so and then I, I finally, I finally figured out like, okay, my dad's an electrical engineer. Like, I think he's making a reasonable amount of money. And so then I would start bothering him. Like, come on, let's go to California or something. <laughs> I'm hearing so many parallels to your story and my story. We drove always, but I'm a little older than you and I was traveling and vacationing before the deregulation of the airlines when airline tickets were $800 a piece. Um, there were no cheap airlines. So we would drive because it's way cheaper to drive across the country than it is to fly across the country. Um, my parents, my dad drove the same car from 1970 to 1992. He bought it brand new though for $2,000 AMC, the ugliest car company on the planet. And <laughs> Um, I, it was embarrassing to drive this, you know, awful car. I won third place in worst car at high school. And now <laughs> that's like, I'm proud of that. Todd Knezovich was number one and he was number one. He had the worst car ever. I can't remember who came in number two and that's okay. Um, but you said something that's so interesting until you were like 13, you were like, oh, I thought we were broke. All my friends get more toys than I do. And that's really hard from a parent standpoint to not give your kid everything they want. My kids come home from school after Christmas and they're like, oh, so-and-so got an iPod and an iPad and an iPhone and they got a computer and they got all this stuff. And I'm like, well, okay, you didn't get all of that. I'm sorry. And you'll thank me for it later, but it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. But then um, all those kids that got the iPhone and all the i stuff, they're not going to be super awesome with money. That's not so judgy. I'm such a bad person, but still like they're not going to be as good with money as my kids are because my kids are conscious of what things cost. And I don't know. I just think that's really important to share with them. Let's move on to you. It's not my show. It's your show. Uh, I worked full time throughout college and ended up graduating in three years so I could save a year of tuition that you deserve an award for that. Good job, Julie. Why did you think to do that? Uh, that was a hard and slightly painful decision um, that at the time, I wasn't exactly sure that I wanted to do that. Um, but I just thought about it and I was like, look, I've got, I've had my college experience. Um, I kind of had gotten everything that I needed about like from the college experience. And it just seemed silly to throw another like 
$25,000 down the drain just so I can have another year of like, like, because if I could graduate in three years and get the education, then like I'm basically paying the $25,000 to have fun and, and hang out on campus with my friends. And ultimately I really wanted to do that, but when it came down to it, I just decided that that was not a good, good rational justification. Here's where our stories diverge because you made the smart choice and I went for another year. <laughs> Okay, so let's get to your post second house experience. You have now bought him out, you've refinanced um, at a higher rate, which stinks, but now you're done with him, completely finished, whatever. You, you've got a rental property and you've got a roommate and you've got yep. a, I imagine, still a pile of cash even after pay, buying him out. Is that right? Yeah, I, I didn't have a ton after. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely had to kind of regroup and, and start resaving after after that, but, but I wasn't so, so, broke. <laughs> so how old are you now with, with two two rental properties, 500000 in real estate assets, ca- a little bit of cash left over? Do you have any retirement accounts? What's the, what's the career status and how's the outlook in general at this point? Yeah, so let's see. That would have probably been like 2013-ish, maybe 2012 when I bought bought that second property. Um, and yeah, as far as retirement savings go, I also, uh, another thing that I can attribute to my dad is, um, he, I opened a Roth IRA when I was 18 years old and, um, did my very best to put the max in that every single year. Um, and then of course, when I started working at my first job out of college, they had a 401k with a match. So I would, I would put that in, um, and yeah, like my career was going, going pretty well. I wasn't, I still wasn't making like a ton of money, um, by any means, but, um, but yeah, things were, things were going, you know, pretty, pretty well. Awesome. So what happens next? So I ended up, um, eventually moving out of that, that large house and turning that just into a straight rental, um, and then I think at that time, I and moved- how did you do that? Because that was a bigger house that seems less well suited to being a rental, right there. So how did how did you do that and and turn that? It was four, you said four beds, five baths, or five beds, four baths? Yeah, yeah, I yeah I was kind of skeptical that I would be able to rent it out, um, just given the size. Uh, but it's been a I've never had trouble renting that that property out, and I've had. I think since 2012, I've also only had to have two tenants. Um, awesome. Can, can you give us an idea about the numbers on that? You said the mortgage was 1600. How, how much yep. are you getting for rent? Um, so when I first started renting it, I was at 2100 a month. And now through just kind of increases, it's, I believe I get 2450 for it a month. That's wonderful. Yeah. Those are good numbers. Especially yeah, for having two tenants. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been really good and it's a newer house. So there hasn't really been, I was, I've started to kind of put my taxes together for, um, 2020 and I was looking at my expenses for that property and it's like, I bought a microwave. (laughs) (laughs) But let's, let's go look at your reserve fund. You only had to buy a microwave, but you have enough money in your reserve fund to replace the furnace, replace the AC, replace the roof, replace the appliances, because you are so smart with money. I have harped on this a lot on the on the show, but when March 2020 happened, people were, that was uh, March 13th, I think they shut down the United States, and people were on bigger pockets in the forums like the next day. How am I going to pay my April mortgage payment? Well, you should have already had your April mortgage payment in the bank. You need to listen to the money May show. And June and July. Like you should have this reserve very comfortably sitting there doing absolutely nothing, waiting for an emergency. So I, 
I've said this too. I think when you buy a house, something always breaks and it's the cost of that repair is inversely proportionate to how much you have in your bank account. So if you've got a very well-funded bank account, you need like a new light switch. But if you're barely scraping by and you're putting down every dollar you have to buy this house, you're going to need a new furnace or a new roof or a new something that's going to happen after you own it. And it's going to be a huge financial crush and murphy's and it, law and it's all going to happen at the worst time when your yeah. tenant is is moving out and that's when the problem is exposed that you have to deal with before you get the new tenant in and you're not getting any income and, and that's just how it goes that's that's the point of the reserve is because you don't need it until you need it um, so again julie is perfect in every way that's right okay <laughs> so we've rented out the place we're getting 2100 um what's what's going on how, what's what's the the next milestone the next part of the journey here yeah, so um, at that point, I've got those two rentals and they're going pretty well. And so then this is when I kind of decided that like, hey, this is a nice way to make make some extra money. So the next house I bought was the first property I bought strictly as an investment property from the get go and did not live in myself. Um, and how, how long after you pay an out, you buy an out um, your ex from the, the mortgage and those types of things is are we talking here? Is this like a year out, six months? I, it was, it took me a while. I, I think I bought the third house, I believe in 2015. So it was probably a good three years after. Um, and during that, that period, you're just accumulating more cash and rebuilding your financial fortress position, those types of things, continuing with the 401k, all that kind of good stuff. Yep. I, I just want to chime in and say that that's the grind here that like we always gloss over this, but like between these periods of activity for almost everybody, when we look back over a, a story that's a couple of years out, there are these periods of inactivity where it's just slowly month by month, accumulating a thousand or 1500 or whatever it is and piling up the, the bank account and then building a position of strength from which you then make this great investment from. Um, can you walk us through the, decision point when when what was that like was that was it intention to become retire early was it intention to build wealth through rentals what did that look like i want to chime in really quick and say to all the people who are listening and saying you know oh well she should have used other people's money and you know built up as fast as she could julie made smart decisions based on her comfort level and it doesn't matter what scott trench does or what mindy jensen does julie has to make decisions that Julie is comfortable with. And jumping in and trying to keep up with the Joneses because all these other people are saying, oh, you should buy more and more quickly and, and you know move into it so you only have to put 3.5% down. If all you have is 3.5% in your bank account for the down payment, you're not ready to buy a house, in my opinion. I'm rather opinionated, but this is my show, <laughs> so I can give my opinion. But I just want to say, Julie, good job at being comfortable before you made the next purchase. Uh, okay. Now let's talk about that next purchase. What did it, what did that decision point look like? And, and what was the mentality? Like when, when did that mentality shift happen? Cause it sounds like it was not intentional until this point. Yeah. I, yeah, I just think it was, it was going so well with the first two properties and I kind of had been saving and I realized like, I've got a pretty significant chunk of cash that I'm sitting on that's not really working for me. Um, you know, I was doing some stock investing and, and things like that, but it just felt like it was really underutilized. And so I was just like, well, I should just buy another, you know, another property. Um, and yeah, the idea at that point still probably for me wasn't like retire early at that point. I still, it was just another way to make some extra money. Um, yeah, I think that was mindset so what'd at that, that point. What would that look like? So I ended up buying a little bungalow, two bed, one bath, $75,000 in Des Moines. And uh, it's been a terrible property. Absolutely terrible. Ooh. Um, Why? Yeah. It's way cheaper than the other properties. I'm wondering yeah, if that it should be. Yeah, it should be this. kicking off tons of cash. So the, my, my first mistake I made was I had some, I bought the house and I was, I needed to have some work done on it. And so I found this guy on Craigslist to do the work for a reasonable price. Dun, dun, dun. 
And, you know, as I kind of was communicating with this guy, he was a really good uh, salesman and, and gave me kind of this sob story of like, well, I, you know, me and my family could, could move into this house. And he didn't have, like, he had been living with his parents. He was a handyman that did a lot of work, like under the table. So it's not like he had, like, I, when I ran his background check and credit check, it was like, he didn't have any credit. Um, he didn't have a, anything on his background check. Um, but I didn't have a great way to like verify income. I didn't have landlords to call cause he'd been living with his parents. And so, but I was excited that, you know, I've got this little rental and I, I rushed to get someone in it. And I also just got my emotions tied into it. Um, I wanted to give this guy a chance and Dun, it didn't dun, end dun. well. Yeah, it did not end well. <laughs> so I want to stop you right there just for a moment to say you are not alone. This is not a unique experience to you, unfortunately. Um, not unfortunately, like you should have all the bad experiences, but just unfortunately, this happens a lot. And I like to say, never go with your gut instead of checking somebody's references. Always go with your gut when their references are good and you still have this feeling that something's off, go with your gut then and say no. But I think a lot of people, when they run a background check, are looking for reasons to say yes. And instead, they should be looking for reasons to say no. Why should I not rent to Julie? Oh, Julie doesn't have a job. That's easy. No. Julie has no credit. Unless you have a really good Dave Ramsey story about how you don't have any credit, but you have like these giant bank accounts and you're really, really helpful um, or you're really, really qualified in other ways, you know, I would not say yes to that person either. But this is also a really common first or second, you know, landlord mistake. And you learn a lot from that experience. So Absolutely. <laughs> how long did this handyman stay in the house and did he do any work on the house? He, he did do some work on the house. Um, but yeah, I think he started renting in the winter months and as a handyman in Iowa, like that kind of work kind of dries up in the winter. And so he immediately was falling behind on rent. Um, and it was just like, I don't know when this, he kept telling me when the spring picks up, he'll be able to get caught up. And so I kind of just let him fall behind in rent for a few months and did not evict him. Um, and then I think it probably was until like maybe April, May, April, May that I finally kind of bit the bullet and was like, I'm going to have to evict this person. Um, and so I did. And uh, he then promptly trashed my house. So... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's another not just Julie experience. Um, that's unfortunate. And I think a lot of landlords, when they first start out, they're like, oh, I don't want to evict them. That's such a horrible process. I'll just wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. And uh, my time in the Bigger Pockets forums has told me that the moment that they're late, rent is due on the first, it's late on the second. If you have a grace period at your state, that doesn't matter. It's still late on the second. You just can't charge late rent until like the fifth or the 10th or whatever you, you file for eviction the very first day that you can, and then you follow through. And if they're going to trash your house, let them trash your house month one, instead of after five months of not paying rent. And then they trash your house. Uh, yeah, how, you know, much, if, how much, if you are, if you are too nice to somebody, then you make an enemy over time with this kind of stuff. If, if you if you have the situation and you evict immediately and don't set a tolerance point, it's over. It moves on. But when you have some a situation like this, they become your enemy because you're giving to them. And it's a weird dynamic of human nature with whatever that this is, where when you are like you, you are allowing this person to live behind on rent, and every month you're you're being lenient, and every month they are getting more and more angry with you because they owe you that money and you're being nice about it. And then they trash your house at the end of it. And it's like, that is that is a, the, the dynamic that goes on here. If you're gonna be charitable, give to charity. Do not do that and do not write a check to some random tenant that is that is not able to pay your rent. 
and you can write that to a charity instead, right? That's not the time and place to be, to be giving. This is, this is the business um, yep. of real estate. Yeah, definitely agree. So okay. Anyways, so um, how much time did, or how much damage did he cause? Did he just make a big mess or did he cause actual damage to the physical property? He mostly made a big mess. Um, he did break some windows oh. and yeah, but mostly, well, yeah. And I mean, it was in bad, it was in, it was in bad shape. Um, and there, the, one of the biggest issues was he had just left a bunch of, there was like 10 mattresses in the house, um, like lots of just food. And so there was quite a bug problem for quite some time that took a very long time to get, to get, um, eradicated. Uh, and, and yeah, just, I think I called 1-800-GOT-JUNK to, um, have them take all the stuff out of the house. And I think they filled like three or four 30 yard dumpsters. Oh, this is yeah. When you it get was cat like, he, friendly. what? This is when you get cat friendly in your rental. <laughs> Sorry, bad he, joke. Okay. He, he I, it looked like he threw like five Goodwill stores into the, into the house. Wow. That is, yeah. that is impressive. So I used to live next to, uh, across the street from somebody who was renting the house and he was a horrible person and I was friendly at first and he would show me all the like free furniture he got on Craigslist. And there was all that heavy, heavy, heavy oak stuff that nobody ever wants. And um, he, he left it all there when he got evicted. <laughs> I'm like, man, that's going to take forever to get out. It's yeah. just so heavy. Yeah. The weird thing was I had gone to that property probably two weeks before the guy got evicted and all that stuff was not in there. And so it's like, he called all of his buddies and just said, Hey, if you have any like trash or, or stuff that you don't want, just come and bring it and, and throw it into this house. That's petty. Yeah. That's petty. Okay. So you, you evicted him in May. When did you next rent out that property? I think it took a good four months to get it rentable again. Like I, I think I rented wow. it in like August of that of that year. Was that a good experience, or was that also? You said you've had a terrible experience with this house. It's it's never attracted great tenants, and I think that's because of its size. So I've never bought another property that that is that small. Um, I've had a lot of. Um, like I've had a lot of single moms that have, uh, rented it and they haven't, it, it's like kind of, I feel like it's the type of house that you rent when it's, you don't want to rent in an apartment anymore and you want to move up to like a small house, but living in an apartment mindset is not the same as like renting a house mindset. And so people get in there and they're just hitting me up for, all these little things and um, yeah, just don't really know how to take care of a house. Do you own this house still? I do. I do. Have you considered selling it right now? It's a hot market in a lot of parts of the world. Is it hot in, in Iowa too? It is. And I have uh, thought about, thought about selling it. Um, I've got a tenant in there right now that has been there for a couple years and, and she has not been, uh, great, but she hasn't been like terrible. And so I've just been kind of like, when she decides she wants to not resign, I'll, I'll think about, um, I'll think about selling it. Okay. I'm going to put on my finance review hat right now. Uh, we have started a new episode of the bigger pockets money podcast called the finance review. And it comes out on Fridays. I'm going to look at this rental house and say, Julie, you are a smart girl who makes amazing money decisions. Cut your losses, put it on the market, get rid of this property. You can sell it with the tenant. The lease runs with the property. You, you advertise it as a tenanted property. You said she's not great. She's not horrible. She's just kind of there. This, how much mental bandwidth does this house take up? Yeah. 85% of my headaches is this property. Sell it. Scott, what is your uh, well, I mean, there's, there's other details to know, but in general, the, 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 the picture looks strongly towards 
sell it. Like, it's not, <laughs> there I, are I, I no. I, I imagine you make a good money now, um, and and life is good, and you've got a, a large portfolio. And I can't imagine that a property with this profile is generating more than like two or three hundred dollars a month in cash flow or net wealth accumulation for you. So like that is chunk change, even if it is technically a good IRR, it's just nothing compared to, to your overall position and it's all your headache. So. so I don't like to disagree with you, Scott, but you're wrong. There is no other information that you need about this property. It takes up 85% <laughs> of her mental bandwidth on problems and it's not awesome. Sell it, Julie. It is okay. Take the money and run in this market when nothing is available. Talk to an agent in the area and sell it. This podcast is you. educational and uh, entertainment purposes only. <laughs> I think, uh, However, uh, run the numbers in your smart Julie mind and you will come to the same conclusion because I am right. Okay. So this was your third property purchased specifically to be a rental. You own yep. seven properties. What happened with number four? Number four was, let me make sure I get this right. Number four um, was also a property that I decided to buy strictly as an investment. And it was basically the same situation. Um, I had been saving money and found myself with money that was just kind of sitting there. And so I thought, okay, time to buy another one. And um, this one is in Marion, Iowa, which is like Eastern Iowa, and it's actually a block and a half away from my parents' house, which is extremely convenient because um, my dad can help with, you know, maintenance issues that, that arise. Um, yeah, and I think, so I think I bought that one in 2017. So like two years after I bought the, um, the disaster house. And, and okay. again, again, we're seeing this like long period of inactivity and what we're missing here is grind. There is, there is a career development going on. There are 401k contributions that are continuing to stockpile. There is a savings rate that is continuing to compound, I would imagine, based on what you've told us before, previous to this. And then we've got the next purchase. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and I think it, by this point, I was... I, I really did, I would say, like grind pretty hard when I first graduated college, probably the first four or five years, um, just saving a lot of money, like not taking vacations, just being super, super frugal. And I think by this this point, um, I was finally starting to like be, feel able to like ease up a little bit and, uh, you know, enjoy myself a little bit more and um, not feel so the the passive income was like really felt like a great safety net for me. Um, what was your passive income at that point? So let's see, I was probably making with those, with those three houses, I was probably making like 1600 bucks. Um, Between your rent and the mortgage, some of which was allocated toward, or, or was that what you're after expense cash flow? That would probably, so that would just be the uh, cash flow after mortgage taxes and insurance. So not, not um, deducting any for the maintenance things that would come up. Yeah. Or disasters like your tenant. It, yeah. Or, property. or disasters. Yeah. Okay. So, so if we say, if we even cut that in half though, 800 a month in, 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 in uh, cash flow is no joke um, uh, at that point with a couple of properties and it sounds like things are going well and, and yep. you're probably also seeing continued increases in your salary from your career growth and those types of things. Yeah. And this is actually probably around the time when, um, I had the opportunity to, um, work on a startup full time. And one of the reasons why I, I, so I ended up, I, I think it would have been 2016, 2017. I, I quit my job and I worked full time on a startup making no money for about nine months. Um, and one of the reasons why I felt like I could take that risk was because at least I was making some money through the real estate. Whereas had I not had that, I don't think I would have been able to make that work. How many months of, of expenses did you have in your reserve fund at that point as well? Oh, a lot, a, like at least, a, at least a year. Yeah. See, I, I think those think those things are directly related and you can't take that chance if you don't have a little bit of passive income and, or a huge reserve fund. And so what is the ROI 
on that reserve fund. Well, okay, it's a half a percent, one percent, whatever it is. I'd be interested to hear where you keep your cash, but it's really thousands of percent or you know, tens, 20, 50, 100 percent ROI because you can take that shot. And even if it doesn't work out, the career implications can be huge by having taken that shot. Right. Yeah. It was definitely a, uh, it was going to be great or it wasn't going to be great, but I was really thankful that I was able to like have that, put myself in a position where I could um, focus my time and energy on that, not have to be like stressing over not, you know, not making any money, which I think, you know, some startups get in trouble because they've got to make money if, if the, if the, um, you know, startup founders um, aren't taking home a paycheck and they kind of have to rush to monetization. So um, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. <laughs> so, so what, 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 uh, how does that work out? And we buy that And then how do things, how, what's the other parts of the story that we're missing between now and the closing on that, that fourth property that we, that you just mentioned? Yeah. So, um, the startup did not work out. Uh, at least as far as it being successful. And actually now this is the point where uh, I start looking for a new job and <laughs> I get a job at Bigger Pockets. All right. Yeah. So, so well, uh, well, walk us through this. Yeah. So I just, the startup shut down and um, I wanted to get back in to a day job doing software engineering and I think I had actually applied for a job at Bigger Pockets maybe like a couple of years prior and like didn't had it didn't hear anything and for whatever reason I just decided to go back and check check the jobs page again um, and applied again and I think I put in my cover letter like hey guys I applied two years ago I think I've gained some good knowledge and skills since then uh, give me another look and. Uh, yeah, so I had been living in Des Moines, Iowa, and um, I would say one of the biggest apprehensions I had at that point was up until that point, I had been a landlord that lived at least in the state where my properties were. And so then when I took the job in Denver, I was a little bit worried about having to transition to being like an out of state, um, out of state landlord. Um, but yeah, that, that hasn't that hasn't been too bad. All right. Well, how, did, how does the bunny story evolve from there after you moved to Denver and joined BP? Yeah. So I ended up renting an apartment um, in Denver. I thought about uh, buying a property, but um, as you guys are aware, it's, it's very expensive uh, to buy there. And so I just, I didn't know how long I was going to stay. So I just ended up renting um, and still, you know, trying to save as much money as I could. And yeah, now I'm trying to think. Um, trying to think the next, so the fifth. You took a couple of side hustles. Like, um, I think you you did very well in our fantasy football league. Uh, <laughs> I, I recall correctly. <laughs> Unlike yeah, some. And, and um, Craig, Craig uh, got me renting my car on Turo when I was in Denver. Ah, Craig Curlop, episode 35 yep. talks about renting his car on Turo. How did your Turo renting car story end? Successful uh, or in a car crash? <laughs> no, it, it worked really well. It worked really well for me. I, since my um, apartment was so close to the bigger pockets office, like I would walk to work every day. And so re- having my car rented out was like no problem whatsoever. Um, yeah, that it was great. Crashed. Of all the, yeah, Craig, Craig, did some crazy things to make money. And I was, I could not make all the sacrifices that he did, but that was one that I was very thankful that he told me about. And that just served to uh, generate more income for you to save for your next rental property. Let me ask you, because this is another question that comes up all the time in the forums. Where do you put the money that you are saving for your next down payment? Where do you keep that? Um, so I have like a basic, a basic checking an account through Bank of America that I try to keep at a reasonable level, maybe like $20,000 or something like that, just like liquid cash. Um, and then otherwise, if I have any excess, then I have money in a um, uh, like options trading account 
and I try to make money on, on that money through that. Oh, like um, calls and puts options? Calls and puts, yeah. Oh. You a seller or a buyer? I am a seller of premium for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, let's talk about this a little bit. Options are, first of all, I'm going to say that options are something that you should not dabble in just because you heard Julie making a great buck on options. Options are something that can cost you a lot of money or cost you a lot of opportunity. Let's say you bought Tesla at $100 a share. You throw an option on there to, let's see, you you sell a call, which means I am selling Julie the right to buy the property or the, the stock at $105 because I think the price is going to go down. Clearly, I am wrong, and the price has shot up to 110. Julie can call me out of my purchase, and now I have to sell it to her at 105, even though it's trading at 110. So you don't lose money in the sense that, like, you bought it at 100 and you're selling at 105. You lose money because you could have sold at 110. So I am saying that this is not something you should take lightly. This is something you should do a lot of research and investigation into. However, sometimes you can make money on this. So Julie, let's talk about your options. That was a great explanation, by the way, Mindy. I was, I was trying to explain it to someone recently and I did not do that, that good of job. So, um, yeah, so I like to think of it as, if you're going to be investing in stocks, to me, I feel like you should be also investing in options. And so the strategy that I typically use is what's called a wheel strategy. So I've got stocks that I like and are bullish on. So I think that they're going to do well. Um, and so I'll sell puts, which is the opposite of a call. So like if I sell a put to you that gives you the right to sell me your shares at a certain price. And so I'll have this list of stocks that I like and every week I'll just sell puts on those, those tickers, um, like, you know, at, at a certain price that's under its current price. So if I like a stock that's at 50 bucks, I might sell a put each week at 45 and I'll get 50 bucks for that, for selling that. And the, the way that that works is at the end of the week, I'm either going to just keep the $50, which is great. Um, and that's usually what happens. Uh, or if for some reason the stock has gone down below $45, then I'm going to buy the hundred shares at $45. Um, but it's a stock that I like and that I want to own. So I don't feel bad about that. Like if I liked it and I was going to buy it at $50, then buying it at 45 is not, is not a bad deal for me. And then once I now have those hundred shares, I do exactly what, what you were talking about is I'll start selling calls. So I've got the shares at, at 45, I'll start selling calls at 50. And, and like you mentioned, you potentially are, um, missing out on a gain. Uh, but the way I look at it is, um, most weeks, the options that you sell are not going to end up being what they say in the money. And so if I start selling calls every week uh, at $50 and I'm collecting, you know, $20, $25 every week in premium, I'm like lowering my cost basis on, on that stock. So then if I do end up having to sell you my shares at 50, if I've been collecting this premium for the past two months, um, you know, if, it, if the stock's at 52, but I've got to sell it to you at 50, the premium that I've been collecting can, can kind of make up for that um, differential. I think that's a really great way to look at it. Um, and then again, caution people that that uh, <laughs> this is something you need to do a lot of research in before you start investing. Do you have to have a certain amount of money in your account when you're selling puts? Because like Julie said, she's selling me a put. I am now exercising the option to make her buy my stock at 45, even though it's only worth, it's selling at 43. So you should have to have money in your account to cover that, right? So this yeah. is not a beginner level strategy. Um, no, right. 
you can do other, there's other strategies you can do. So, so there's stocks that I like, like Tesla, for example, and um, I don't have enough money in my account to cover a hundred shares of Tesla by any means. And so you can do other things like a, it's called put spreads um, that you could do uh, that would, that wouldn't require you to have um, that much money in your account to cover. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this is a, a awesome strategy and I don't really know much too much about it. Um, so we might have to bring an expert on and go through this in a lot of detail on a future episode, Mindy. I think that'd be, that'd be awesome, but it I sounds so like too. this is, yeah, I think this is a way to potentially have your excess liquidity earn a little bit more of a premium over time with um, some, some risks to that. Um, and you know, you're going to probably earn a good return on a week to week or month to month basis. And then you're gonna have a big loss, uh, all, all of a sudden with, with a strategy like this, but over time, it probably yields a pretty good overall return for you on your, on your savings with that. Um, let's, let's continue. And this is, this is, it sounds like something you do with a small portion of your cure cash. Yeah. So any excess that I have over like the 20 K that I want to keep in liquid, I'll, I'll have in that account, but I'm not, I'm never really placing, you know, big bets. Like my goal is every week to make a hundred dollars selling premium. So, you know, 400 extra dollars a month. And I, I try to do that, uh, very safely. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not trying to like make huge big gains or anything like that because it can be risky. Um, yeah. And then, but yeah, that's pretty much. And then outside of um, just the normal retirements accounts, that's pretty much where, where all my money stays. Awesome. We should definitely look at that. Could, can you give us a high level overview of, of uh, life after BP and what you've been doing in the last couple of years with, with your, your real estate and investing journey? Yeah, sure. So um, when I left bigger pockets, I got a job for stitch fix um, and uh, nothing against bigger pockets. They, the company Stitch Fix, they have always had a remote engineering team and I've always wanted to travel and just have more flexibility. So that was the main, um, impetus for leaving. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, in, uh, so, um, I was dating someone, we ended up like moving into his grandma's house and, um, being able to live like basically rent free, which is really nice. So I was again, being able to save a lot of money. And then in 2019 for stitch fix, I, uh, went to London, um, on assignment and they were paying for my housing there, which was great. And so I was again, able to save more money. And then, um, when my time in London was coming to an end, uh, I kind of was like, I don't want to go back to Iowa. I want to, I want to live somewhere else. And so while I was still in London, I just decided that I wanted to move to Nashville, having never been to Nashville before. <laughs> and so again, I just like found a house and bought it sight unseen other than just like a FaceTime showing. And um, it had a separate unit basement apartment. So it wasn't like a legitimate duplex. Um, there had been like uh, a handicapped guy that was living in the house with his um, like caretakers and they had turned the basement into like its own little unit. Um, and so when I uh, moved to Nashville, I lived in that basement uh, apartment and then rented out the bedrooms and the upstairs um, to cover to cover the mortgage. So, so now that's the fifth property. It sounds like there's two more sandwiched yep. between the one you described earlier. So, so you're, you're in a situation currently where you own seven properties and those yes. are spread across Iowa, Iowa, Tennessee. And then, um, the, so the sixth property that I bought was in August of 2020, I bought a lake house in Eddyville, Kentucky. Um, that which is, which is an easy drive from Nashville. Yeah, it's like an hour and 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and that has been my first like foray into Airbnb. So I kind of bought it as like a COVID 
induced, like, like I was just sitting around with my roommates one day and we were just like, it'd be so nice to have a lake house right now just to be able to get away. And we just kind of went on Zillow and found the closest like lake community. And then I was like, wow, the prices here aren't that, aren't that bad. And I found a house that looked reasonable, drove up like the next weekend to look at it and then just like put in an offer and, and bought it. Um, which was not super, like super well planned out, but luckily it's, it's actually been working out extremely well as an Airbnb. I, I just see this theme throughout your journey where you buy first and ask questions later. Uh, and you, but, but you, and, and so some people might call that very risky, but you're doing that from a fina- a position with a, with a financial fortress backing you up to allow you to learn and take the, take that action in those risks, which I think is, you know, a lot of people will, will do a lot of research and, and, and be really cautious and all that kind of stuff and buy with no reserves and no financial position. And that's more risky than what you're doing, even though you're, you're, you're buying property seemingly on a whim one weekend with some friends after you look at a couple of pictures on Zillow. So I, I think that that's a really interesting potential takeaway from this, from your money story is that just by doing the basics right, you're allowed to experiment and take these risks and have a couple of painful learning lessons alongside long-term snowball effect, uh, uh, wins, right? Your RRR, I don't know what it would what it was over these t- the course of these properties. It probably wasn't optimal, but you're rich at the end of it anyways because you've been doing <laughs> the, 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 the fundamentals correctly the whole time, I think. Is that, would you think that's fair? Yeah, I yeah. I've, I have had people that, you know, will contact me wanting to get into real estate and they've got these like very fancy Excel spreadsheets and they're, um, you know, really analyzing quite a bit. And I am kind of like, I've never really done any of this. I have a pretty simple strategy of like, I want to buy a house that I think is going to cash flow at least $500. And I do a little bit of research to see if that plays out. And then, yeah. And then if it doesn't, then I'll figure out but, something else. But I buy it between huge periods of inactivity after I snowball a gigantic cash position and clearly have enough cash, not only to make the down payment, but, but have that left over. And then I have, you know, and I'm, I'm constantly maintaining that cash position with this, this nice game you're playing with the, the options there to, to, to sell that, that premium. And so that works with, with that, with those fundamentals in place. Your strategy would be extremely dangerous if you're playing it close to the chest and 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 putting all of your cat liquidity into those properties at once, and all of a sudden all that stuff becomes necessary because any deviation from the plan wrecks you. Um, with that, go ahead, Mindy. It sounds like most of these properties she's purchasing as a primary residence, so she's using the lower interest rate. And it comes, so the primary residence comes with a one-year occupancy requirement in most cases. Please read your documents and speak to your lender. But that allows you to get in at less than 20% down if that's your option. It allows you to have the lower interest rate, although right now, like what's the difference between an owner-occupant and a non-owner-occupant, like half a percent at 2% to start with or something. So it's maybe not as big a deal right now, but that's a big... um, that's a big opportunity that we need to highlight. But this is the market. This is how the world works in the world of real estate investing for most people. So we, we always hear about these folks who are buying lots of properties and aggressively scaling their portfolios because those are the folks who like the most to talk about real estate investing. Um, which is why that, why we're, why we're hearing about that. But the 90% of single family rentals, duplexes, triplexes, and quads are owned by people like Julie who own less than 10, total structures and buy them over a period of a decade. We just heard a decade's worth of real estate purchases starting in 2010 and finalizing with this last one, this lake house in 20 in 2020. That's seven properties over 10 years. That is normal. That is what most investors are doing in this market. And there's good reason for it, like Mindy said, because you're able to use better financing options. And there's good reasons, like we just heard from Julia's story about how you're able to again, stack up this cash and there's periods of huge inactivity between these purchases. And then maybe a couple, maybe a spurt here and there, but really a a two to three year, 
a, a one to one to two to three year time period between each purchase, especially in the beginning. And, and it's beginning to compress now that your, your snowball is probably quite large. The amount of cash you're committing <laughs> per month. It's probably very different than it was when you first started. Yeah. I, yeah. That's a great, a great point. It feels like it has taken a long time to get here, but um, yeah, now, now everything's just moving, you know, super quickly where every six months I've got a chunk of cash that I need to figure out what I need, what I should do with. And it's not just real estate, it's your career and it's your other savings and, and, and other what, the, what you're spending and all those different types, types of things that are compounding to this, where it goes from thousand a month or to 2000 to three to four. I don't know how much you're saving now, but maybe it's in that ballpark. And that's, that's fantastic. That's the journey. You're, you're on the other side. So <laughs> let's yeah. talk about keeping up with the Joneses for a moment, because what Scott just said you're, he said periods of inactivity, which is makes it sound like you're not doing anything, uh, but you are making a purchase and then you're not making a purchase and then you're making a purchase. And I feel, th- I think a lot of people who are just starting out on their real estate journey are saying, oh, Julie has seven houses. I need to have seven houses because Julie has seven or Scott has eight units. I need to have eight because Scott has eight. Don't compare, and I, this is not my quote, this is somebody else's who's, I can't remember, but don't compare the start of your journey to the middle of Julie's. Or if this is the end of Julie's, don't compare the start of your journey to the end of Julie's journey. Don't compare yourself to Scott. He's the CEO of Bigger Pockets. He's going to probably have more opportunity for real estate investing than you are if you're just starting out and you don't know anybody in real estate and that you're like, ooh, this would be cool. So don't try to keep up with the Joneses when you're buying a property and put yourself in a position of financial weakness that is going to put your entire financial future in jeopardy because you had to buy one more house because you read somebody on bigger pockets saying, Oh, don't let that money sit in a bank account. You should use that as leverage, use other people's money, blah, blah, blah. I cringe when I see those things because you don't know who you're talking to. And I don't know who I'm talking to when I'm saying this, I'm just talking to all of my listeners and saying, Hey, purchase on your timeline. Don't worry about what Julie's doing or Scott's doing or that other person on Bigger Pockets is doing. Make a purchase when you are financially comfortable to make a purchase. I was going to say I support all of that, and I want to know how the outlook is for you now and what's next before we get into the famous four. Yeah, so Mindy, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I know we chatted a little bit about that um, as far as I think when you get into real estate, it's a very, it can be very exciting, can be very daunting. And there's kind of similarly with everything in life, there's always going to be someone that has amassed more wealth than you, like anything in life, there's someone that's better than you in in everything. And at some point, um, you've got to like, not, not let that bother you, I guess. And I'm as guilty as that, um, as anyone, uh, I read stories about the people like the headlines of like, this person's 26 and they did a million dollars of real estate deals last year. And I'm like, crap, what am I doing with my life? You know, (laughs) clearly you're just a big loser with only having seven properties. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I think like celebrating like small wins is important and also, um, like learning to, uh, like love, love the, the journey. Um, I recently started training jujitsu and that's something that I'm having to learn in that aspect of my life too. It's like, it's going to take, a, it's going to be a long road, but you gotta, you gotta love the journey and eventually um, you'll, you'll get to the end. So um, my goal is to get to $7,000 in um, net quote unquote passive income from real estate in the next, by the end of 2022. Um, and then at that point I want to, um, I don't know, consider, I don't, I don't know what I want to do with my life yet, but I want to have the flexibility and options to, um, potentially pursue something different, um, at that point, but I don't really know what that's going to be yet. So I plan on Mindy, you kind of ruined my plan, but I was planning on paying off the, the hell house, (laughs) um, (laughs) But maybe you can I'll pay be it off when you sell maybe it. Maybe I'll be selling it. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, and then, yeah, just, uh, just, I'm going to turn the house that I'm currently living in into a rental. Um, and then uh, just 
yeah, probably purchase some more, um, probably back in Iowa, honestly, because I know that market pretty well now and um, I have good contacts and network there. That's great. Having contacts and networks and knowing the market makes it a lot easier to, um, to like plant your money there while you're waiting for, you know, another lake house or another beach house. Yeah. Okay. Well, is there anything else you want to talk about before we move on to our famous four? Let's do the famous four that you sent me the questions and there is five. Yes. Yes. This, this is the, uh, that's the joke that I always use. And then somebody sent me a note. They're like, that's so dumb. Well, I think it's funny. Not everybody listens to every episode. It's time for the famous four questions. These are I the think same it's funny five that someone questions. sent you a note saying that it is dumb. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's time for our famous four. These are the same five questions we ask of all of our guests. Julie, are you ready? Ready. Okay, Julie, what is your favorite finance book? Don't say set for life. Oh it's my okay. gosh, that's what I have written down. <laughs> is it really? really? Yes, I went to my goodreads.com and like filtered my recommendations by stars. And like the first five star book I had that was like a finance book was set for life. So, wow. Yes, it's true. It's, it's true. you know what? It is such a good book. We need to shout out Scott's dad, Randy, for um, forcing him to rewrite the entire thing after the first time he wrote it. He gave it Drivel. to his dad to read. <laughs> His dad <laughs> called it drivel. I, I, like it. Did, I didn't send it to him again. So yeah. <laughs> he, he still hasn't read the new one. I think he's scared too. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to send him a copy. Randy, I will send you a copy. Um, it is a great book. It's a wonderful book. I was just teasing because I thought you were going to have another book. That's great though. Your first five-star review was Set for Life. If you have not checked out Set for Life, that is a book that Scott wrote and it's um, brilliant to to paraphrase every five-star review that he has. Well, thank, thank um, you for the plug. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. yeah. What was your biggest money mistake? Uh, I would say we've already talked about both of them. It was buying that crappy property and then also uh, getting on a mortgage with someone that I was not married to. All right. I like it. Well, I don't like the mistake. I, I, I like that as a mistake. <laughs> It is, it, it's not the most crushing financial mistake, uh, but still it's a good lesson to learn. Uh, what is your best piece of advice for people who are just starting out? I would say, um, again, I think we touched on this too, but uh, at some point, like just kind of jump into it and like think, I always like to think about like, what's the worst thing that could happen? Uh, I really like uh, stoic philosophy. And so um, I think a lot of people get really interested in real estate. And then for whatever reason, they just listen to all the podcasts, they read all the books. And for whatever reason, they, they don't pull the trigger. Um, and I think just at some point, uh, you got to jump in knowing that not everything's going to go your way. It's not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. Um, but as long as you've, you know, got some escape plans, it will usually turn out. Okay. Nice. What is your favorite joke to tell at parties? So I got these questions slightly before this podcast aired and four seconds before the podcast. Aired. <laughs> and so I don't have a joke, but I will say that if anyone has not seen the video with like the lawyer with the cat on zoom, the zoom filter cat. <laughs> I'm not that a cat. Is, <laughs> that I watched that like 25 times last night. So that's going to be the funny thing I talk about for a long time. All right. So we, we have two, we have two things we have to link to videos that we have to link to in the show notes here. One is that video. And the second is the Saturday Night live Zillow skit um, yes. that aired, I think last week, which was fantastic. Um, also hilarious. I resonated was... way too much with that. Zillow this... is real estate investor porn. The <laughs> CEO of Zillow commented after that sketch, he said, have we been marketing Zillow all wrong? <laughs> That's, that was really perfect. Okay. Julie, great. where can people find out more about you? Uh, that's a good question. I do not have a lot of 
presence on the internet, but um, I am on bigger pockets and the traditional social media sites and pretty much my username everywhere is J Kent, which is my last name, 2910. All right, we'll link to that. Uh, we'll link to several of those uh, in the show notes as well. Julie, cool. this is a lot of fun. Thank you for sharing your story today. I think that people are going to get a lot of value out of this story. Yeah, it was so good to catch up with you guys and chat. Yeah, yes. it was great to see you guys. You. Hopefully you one day visit. I'll be able to. I really have been wanting to come to Denver. And when, when and if COVID ever ends, I will be coming to Denver and uh, saying hello. Perfect. Well, I hope to see you soon. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Okay. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you soon. Yep. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, Scott, that was Julie Kent. It's always nice to catch up with her. How did you like the show today? I thought it was great. I, I mentioned this in the intro, but I just, again, think that this is the story of how most people in America end up owning multiple rental properties over time. They're you know, Fannie Mae, fixed rate, conventional mortgages, bought over a period of a decade or more, um, slowly, methodically, um, and then you find yourself very wealthy with a lot of options one day and, and very little stress. And that's, that's the right, that's a right way to do this. And I think it's great. And I think it's worth learning from, you know, after we stopped recording with Julie, she said, Oh, it might not be the most exciting story. No, this is the best story. All the stories that we have heard on this show are the boring stories, the repeatable stories, the I could do that too, because there weren't special circumstances involved in her journey. And I think that's really important to note. I didn't win the lottery and bought 50 rental properties. I worked slow and steady and saved. I invested. I did smart things with my money. And I just want to reiterate that the the position of financial strength, as you always call it, is such an important place to be when you're starting to invest. Yep, absolutely. Okay, Scott, should we get out of here? Let's do it. From episode 181 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is Scott Trench, and I am Mindy Jensen saying sayonara, muchachos.